Our Father and our God, we thank you for this Lord's Day. You've gathered us that we might rest more securely and freely in Christ in the gospel. And you've gathered us that you might make disciples of us, that you might teach us about yourself and your faithfulness, your holiness, your justice, your righteousness, your goodness, and your truth. So we thank you for your word. We thank you for the Holy Scriptures and these stories from ages ago and what they would have to teach us about you and ourselves and the lives you, you call us to live uh, in this gritty world. Um, thank you for those you've brought. Uh, be glorified as we, we learn and as we discuss the things of you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, Genesis 34. Um, remember, Jacob has... Uh, settled down in Canaan. He's bought some land from uh, Shechem's sons. Jacob's put down roots. And you notice what he names the place there. Look, look at the end of uh, 33. Remember, this, this all comes on the heels of, of Jacob wrestling with, with Esau. Jacob is really a wrestler, right? He wrestles with Esau. He wrestles with Laban. Then he wrestles with God. He's got a lot of tenacity. And... and he makes this, this interesting promise, if you go back like a couple chapters, um, he, made, he made an interesting promise as he first went out. The sun was down, it was dark, he used a stone as a pillow way back in, in chapter uh, 28. And he had basically nothing, leaving his parents' house, leaving Esau under not such good certain terms. Remember, he had stolen the birthright. Esau had given the birthright. He had deceived his father into getting the blessing. And now Esau's after his blood. His father appears to be on his deathbed. And he goes out, and it's dark, and he's got nothing. Who knows what lies ahead of him? He's supposed to go get a wife from his, his uncle's place, right? And he has this vision of angels ascending and descending, and he says, surely this is the house of God. And he makes this interesting claim, like God was in this place, I didn't know it. And look what he says there, 2815. This is a, a dream now. He, he's going out as a sojourner. As we come back here in 34, he's starting to settle down. But look what he says. God co comforts him and calms him in, in 2815. Behold, I am with you. I will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I've promised you. <laughs> and, and you can imagine, okay, that's why he wrestles with God as we looked at last week so intensely, right? He wants the promise. He wants the blessing. He wants the assurance that God's going to do what he promised him to do as he heads back into that, you know, promised land and he's meeting Esau. Like he's going to hold on for dear life. And look, look what Jacob says. God says all these things. And when you think about it, he's certainly afraid. And one of the things about God, he, when we're afraid, he says, fear not, but I am with you. That's always the other aspect of the comforting thing. It's not just God saying, don't be afraid, but he promises his presence. You see Jesus doing that with the disciples in the boat. Um, you see angels doing that. But God here, I will be with you. And then look, look what he says. Look what Jacob says, though. Verse 16. Jacob awoke from sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. And he was afraid. How awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God and the gate of heaven. So he sets up a pillar, a place of worship, calls the place Bethel. And then in verse 20, listen, check out his vow here. If God will be with me and will keep me in the way that I go and will give me bread to eat and clothing to wear so that I may come again to my father's house in peace, then the Lord shall be my God. And the stone which I have set up for a pillar shall be God's house. And of all that you give me, I will give a full tenth to you. And so, what do you, what do you think of Jacob making conditions to God there? Is, yeah, is that a little iffy? Is that profane? Is that presumptuous? Is it improper? Is it faithful? Is it a little bit of faithlessness? Let's, let's talk about it. You don't have to be shy. Does it seem preposterous to you? It seems presumptuous to me. Presumptuous, yeah. How dare he put God in the dock, right? God is God. We, the, the, the thing, though, is that it would certainly appear to be that. God, if you do this, then, like, maybe a little lack of faith. But he's taking God at his word. God just promised all these things he's going to do. And he says, you know, God, if you do it, you're going to be my God. And we know what happens. He goes away for seven years and labors his, 
his behind off and then gets a switcheroo for the wife and has to labor again another seven years. And then Laban deals very unjustly with him, treating him like a servant, almost to the point where Laban's countenance has changed and now he's angling after you know, Jacob and Jacob's sheepdom. And yet God prospers him as he causes the goats and all the livestock to mate. And he's, he's just prospered beyond his wildest dreams. But then, of course, Esau's hanging over the horizon. And the, the one who, you know, he sold the stew to, he birthright, the one who he tricked into getting his blessing. And, he, and then he goes toe-to-toe with God and he's just holding on for dear life, even as his hip's taken out, right before he meets Esau. Esau. And God certainly changes him to the point to where when he meets Esau, as we look, this is where we closed last week, he's actually blessing Esau. He's giving Esau like the birthright blessing, all the livestock, like so many things. Take this blessing, brother. Go, go. He's like changed, completely changed. Is there, is there anything different in the communication in the Old Testament and this even being sort of Hebrew culture in terms of the terminology where God is actually he's directly speaking to them? I mean, he actually hears it. Yeah. And once you get to Christ, and now we have the mediator here. I don't know that we have that same kind of personal, direct interaction like that that they have here. So I don't know if it's sort of changed between the Old Testament sort of paradigm and the New Testament paradigm that we live under. Now. That, that's a good point. That's a really good point. I think we let's go to Second Peter. Second Peter is a great little section. Like God, you know, Hebrews talks about you know, and God spoke in many times in many different ways. You know that that whole passage. Mm-hmm. Long ago, at many times, in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things. But then when you go to Hebrews, you have this interesting, uh, I'm sorry, First Peter. Second Peter chapter 1. Second Peter chapter 1. So what you have is this, this instance of, uh, in Second Peter, Apostle Peter, right? You think of one of Christ's most inner disciples in her circle. Peter, who else? Do you guys remember? James and John, James and John right? And they're, they're with Jesus in these very intimate moments. And, and what he's saying is like, you know, um, make your calling and election sure. And then it, here's what he says in verse 16. This is really important. For we did not follow cleverly devised myths, 2 Peter 1.16, when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. So back to Bruce's point. Like, what, what about revelation? God's revelation changes. So you have like Adam and Eve in the garden with revelation. You know, God coming to uh, Jacob in wild dreams as he sleeps on a rock pillow. And then God himself and Christ coming, speaking, you know, the words that the Father tells him and shows him to do, doing the works the Father shows him to do. And then you have this cadre of disciples who are with him, with the God-man, with the person of, of Christ. And then Peter's writing about maybe a generation later. And what he's doing, he's writing to the church, basically to us. And he's trying to tell us, he's trying to set a pattern for how we're, we're to uh, relate to God's revelation or God's works and the way he's revealed his works, what he's done, what he's promised to do. And, and he says, one, we didn't follow cleverly devised myths, which means what? Neither should you. Okay? That's like his first point when it comes to Christ. Look, he says, we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, the voice was born to him by the majestic glory. This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven. We were with him on the holy mountain. So time out. It's quiz time. <laughs> What's he talking about there? Mount Transfiguration. Transfiguration, exactly. So Peter says, I was up there. You know, John was there too. James was there too. We were there. And we, saw, we heard this amazing, we had this amazing mountaintop experience of transfiguration. Remember his, his face shone. Who else was up there? Elijah and Moses, and they're talking about what? His exodus, his departure, the cross. And Peter wants to put up those places for them all to dwell. And then God interrupts him. He doesn't mention that part. Right? I was interrupted. But he says, we're eyewitnesses of his glory. Okay? So look, I got this great experience. And then look what he contrasts his great eyewitness experience with, with Christ, radiant uh, in holiness 
And then the father's benediction, like blessing word, command to listen to my son. Look what he contrasts that real experience with. We ourselves heard the word. And we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed. To which you will do well to pay attention. As to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. What does he contrast his experience with or compare his experience with? Scripture. And, and really, the, the language, I believe, in the, in the Greek, we have the more sure prophetic word fully confirmed. <laughs> more sure than his recollection upon his experience is the revelation of God in the Holy Scriptures of the Old and partially he has in mind the New Testament Scriptures. And then, of course, we know what's to come. Like, this is a more sure prophetic word. Certainly about Christ and His sufferings and glories. But when you think of all prophecy of Scripture, right? Men speak from God as they're carried along by the Holy Spirit. He's basically saying, like, and Bruce, this may not answer your question. Well, it does. I mean, it's a very different experience than Jacob and Esau didn't have that, right? I mean, they have God speaking to them. Yeah. It is, but, but in our culture, we tend to think the realest thing is our experience and then our recollection of that. And even what the apostle's saying, who is with Christ and heard the Father's voices, something more sure than my experience is the more sure prophetic word that's fully confirmed. So the revelation from God. And of course, the revelation from God in the dream is the revelation from God here in Genesis. And when you think when we get to 34, uh, I'm sorry, 30, the end of 34, look, look what Jacob does. He comes to Shechem, eight, verses 18 and following. He camps in the city, and from the sons of Hamor, Shechem's father, he bought for a hundred pieces of money the piece of land on which he had pitched his tent. Then he erected an altar there and called it El Eloi Israel. When you think of God of Israel, remember, God's changed his name in the previous chapter. Like he changed it from Jacob to Israel. And, and it's, a, it's a beautiful scene because what he's saying is basically this God is my God. <laughs> like, he, he made maybe a, what appeared to be a presumptuous statement, but really he was taking God at his promise and his word. Like, they're not, their relationship and what they're entering into with God is much less fully formed than what we know here in 2020. <laughs> they're kind of figuring it out as they go. And the creator of the heavens and earth, God of Abraham and of Isaac. Okay, I get that. But like, what are you to me? I've heard of your faithfulness. And so it may seem like a lack of faith to say, God, if you do this, then you'll be my God. But really, that's, you know, how we walk it out, at least how he was walking it out back then. And then we have this whole scene with, with, with Dinah. Um, it's, it's kind of a wild scene. Look in verse one, Dinah, the daughter of Leah. Think of Leah. She's described, this is very important. She's described there as the daughter of Jacob or the daughter of Leah? Leah. But is she the daughter of Jacob? Absolutely she is. Right? She's got you know, 12 sons and a daughter and maybe then some or 11, uh, 12. And that, that tells you something because you, you remember all the way back, Leah was loved less, it says. You remember that? You know, he wanted to marry Rachel. He worked seven years for Rachel. Seemed like a day for Rachel for the bride price. And then he switched with Leah. And it's, it's sobering. Uh, so Jacob went into Rachel also, and he loved Rachel more than Leah and served Laban for another seven years. And not only does he love Leah less, verse 31 of chapter 29 says, When the Lord saw that Leah was hated, he opened her womb. But Rachel was barren. And so he, not, he doesn't just love her less, but major favoritism here. Does that remind you of anything? Any favoritism? <laughs> Isaac's favoritism, he loves Esau more than Jacob. He loves Leah more than Rachel. Leah's hated. It, and Dinah, of course, has described her as the daughter of Leah. You, you see it very subtly in this text. Go ahead, Larry. Uh, when you say hated, uh, isn't that a word that is a comparison word? Scripture says we should hate our own families compared to our love for the Lord. 
So it's not necessarily a hate, but a comparison of love less than we love the Lord. He has priority. Why not? In that New Testament text, sure, because we're to love our neighbor as ourselves. But in comparison to the great commandment of loving God, it pales into comparison, right? right? So it may appear to be hate. But what's going on here with Jacob isn't quite that New Covenant, like spirit-infused priority love for God. It's, I didn't agree to this woman. I was swindled and I love her a lot less. And you know, even to the point where it doesn't just say love less, it says actually God through the Spirit says love less and then says hated in the very next verse. And you see the way that she begins to name her kids. She's always having hope that you know, God's good and provides, but these kids will, will cause her husband to somehow you know, love her more. It's, it's, a, it's a wild scene. I think hated is fair to say. Hated, loved less. It's, there's a lot there. You, you think she names Reuben. See a son. right? Simeon, God heard. Levi, attached. Judah, praise. Issachar, remember, they were trading, they are dealing with mandrakes to who would sleep with Jacob that night. <laughs> Issachar, wages for hire. Zebulun, honor, right? She thinks when she has a sixth son, Zebulun, think how many years have passed. Hus- maybe my husband will now honor me. That's what she says. After years and years. So loved less, Larry, hated. Like, loved less by her husband. She keeps having these kids thinking that he's going to... And, and, and Dinah, you know, the daughter of Leah. Not Jacob. He is, she is Jacob's daughter. There's a huge, there's, the story's transitioning here from the story of you know, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to Jacob's sons. And there's a lot of issues there, and, and they're, they're, they're subtly in this text. And you see it in the next verse. We should have some concern here. Look, um, whom she had born to Jacob went out to see the woman of the land. Now, when you think about that, um, should we have a sense of unease here in this culture? We, we should, because you remember um, Abimelech, um, says, you know, he says to Isaac, remember Isaac and Rebekah? You know, hey, say you're my sister, just like Abraham and Sarah, right? He learned it from his dad, you know. They have these big sheepdoms, and they're responsible for hundreds of people, and they have a beautiful wife. So say, say you're my sister, and, you know, if, if you just say you're my husband, they may want to kill me and just take everything I have. But if, if you say you're my sister, then maybe we can negotiate some sort of like, you know, marriage thing and find out that you're actually my wife. You know, it's like a way to try to cover his hide, protect his own, and, and be in a position to where he's not seen as an obstacle. And look what Isaac, Abimelech says to Isaac. One of the people might have easily lain with your wife. And you think about that. Like, wow, it, it's easy for someone to lie with an unwilling, unwilling woman, as Rebecca would have been. But Abimelech says it would have been easy. There's a number of stories uh, about women being taken from their families uh, by people of the land without consent. Sarah's taken by Pharaoh. Later, Abimelech. Rebecca's almost taken by Abimelech. And so we'll look at verses 2 through 4. This is kind of an interesting scene. It's a terrible scene. Absolutely terrible scene. You think of these two kings. You have... Shechem, and then you have who? Uh, he's the son of Hamar. Hamar the Hivite is the king. Shechem's the prince. You think he's ever really heard no in his life? Never. He's got a great sense of entitlement. He's the prince. His father's the king. He gets whatever he wants. And he probably never really had to deny himself. So you see the character is formed in such a way that, that he's overwhelmed with lust. You think of desire in scriptures in the New Testament, at least in the Greek, it's epithumeo. It could be good, over desire for good, for God, for God's holiness, for obedience. Epithumeo could be bad, covetousness, which is idolatry. So this guy's got unchecked virtue big time. Unchecked, unformed, power. He's going to get what, what he wants. And look what he, well, look what he sees. When Shechem, the son of Hamar, the Hivite, the prince of the land... Next one in line. Saw her. Sees her. He seizes her. And he lays with her and humiliates her. Like, how, do, how would you characterize that? It's improper, right? Yeah, exactly. So there's questions on whether it was like seduction or rape. Like, it's sobering language. And then he talks, you know, tries to sweet talk her. Did you catch that? His soul was drawn to Dinah, the daughter of Jacob. He loved the young woman and spoke tenderly to her. So what's he say to his father? Get her for my wife. And you think about this huge power play, like power, absolute power, what's it, this, this, 
corrupts absolutely. Like these guys have never really heard no. They're the kings and, and they reign and they rule and they do what they want. So he lies with her, but you have to think he also abducts her. Um, she's with him, not back at her house with her brothers and her father. Um, <clears throat> and, and you think of in the scriptures in Deuteronomy, Exodus, <clears throat> there's all sorts of stories about betrothed or unbetrothed women, virgins, getting uh, abducted in a city and lying with someone or abducted in a field. And the, the penalties range from both being murdered because she didn't cry for help or in the field. If she cried for help and no one heard, then just take that guy out or to where there'd be an arranged marriage and the, and the husband is never, ever, ever to divorce his wife, which means you to honor her and to care for. It's totally different than our culture. I'm not green lighting it. I'm not approving. I'm just saying this culture is so radically different. But what he did, does is absolutely profane. And you catch the language because it says she, she, he did things that ought not to be done. Did, did you catch that? And you think of it, Shechem and his dad, they, they come to Jacob, right? And Dinah, of course, is back there. She's not with him. And Jacob hears what happened. Jacob had heard that he had defiled his daughter Dinah, but his sons were with his livestock in the field. So Jacob held his peace until they came. And Hamar, the father of Shechem, went out to Jacob to speak with him. Sons of Jacob came in from the field as soon as they heard of it. And the men were indignant and very angry because he had done this outrageous thing in Israel, lying with Jacob's daughter for such a thing must not be done. Clearly a profane thing that he did. And when you, when you think of it, you begin to see the real uh, fractures in the family. And it's... And, and if you look at verse 8, look, Haman's king of Shechem goes to Jacob, tries to buy him off. Did you see that? As soul of my son, Shechem longs for your daughter. Please give her to him to be his wife. Make marriages with us. Give your daughters to us. Take our daughters. You shall dwell with us. Land will be open to you. Dwell, trade, get property in it, right? Be prosperous. And then, and then Shechem says, you know, let me find favor in your... Whatever you say, I will give. Name your price. And of course, these, these, these sons... Some of them have a great, great love for her. Some of them probably have a little bit less of love for her. But it's an outrageous thing. And when you, when you think of it, uh, Leah is the one with the firstborn sons. Remember, she's loved less. She was hated by Jacob. These sons have seen favoritism for Rachel's kids. And this Dinah is Leah's daughter with who? Reuben. Who else? Probably Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar. You go down the line. These are the oldest sons. And you see this, this fracture that comes in. Oh, just, you know, let her be my wife. The sons of Jacob answered Shechem and his father, Hamar, deceitfully because he had defiled their sister Dinah. You know, we can't do this thing, right, they say? Did you catch that? We can't do this thing. You know, be circumcised. Look, verse 17. But if you will not listen to us and be circumcised, then we will take our daughter and we will be gone, right? You know, so what's their plan? You know their plan, right? Look at, look at the, the languages. The language there in verse 14 is very important. They said to them, we cannot do this thing to give our sister to one who is uncircumcised. You, you, you see who's doing the dealing here. Who is it? The brothers. The brothers who love their sister. And they're out for blood. They're out for revenge. And of course, when you think of Shechem and his father, look at what they say when they go back to the men of the city to try to, you know, green light this marriage arrangement. The father wants to give his son what he loves, what he lusts for, what he longs for. They make it, they make it seem like, hey, you know, this little sheepdom, yeah, they're pretty big, but, you know, we the Hivites in the land of Shechem, we can take them out. Look at the subtle language there in uh, verse 20. They go to the city gate. Hamar and Shechem go to the city gate, right? The prince and the king. They spoke to the men of the city. Look at verse 29. These men are at peace with us. Let them dwell on the land and trade in it. For behold, the land is large enough for them. Let us take their daughters as wives and let us give them our daughters. Only in this condition will these men agree to dwell with us. Circumcision, okay? Look at verse 23. Will not their livestock, their property, and all their beasts be ours? Only let us agree with them and they will dwell with us. That's not a throwaway passage. Take the daughters and then, you know, we'll, we'll just expand our kingdom and our territory and they'll be kind of under our thumb as like a vice region. Like these guys are shady. And honestly, what, um, what Simeon and Levi do is, is improper as well. Not, 
blessing it. Like they slay the whole city, right? It's, it's a terrible thing. And then, and then Jacob's like, hey, you know, you made me stink to the highest heaven. We got to get out of here. And then look, look what they say. Verse 31. Should he treat our sister like a prostitute? You, you see the favoritism? They, he doesn't, they don't even say, shall, shall they treat your daughter like a prostitute? Like these brothers love their sister dearly. You get the point. Jacob is the favoritism, the, the, the decades of favoritism and loving their mother less and, you know, favoring Rachel's kids. Like, it, it's, a, it's a wild scene. Go ahead, Barry. You want to jump in? Yeah. It's like Jacob lacked spiritual leadership to let everything go to the pot. Yeah. It's a, it's a, it's a terrible scene. Yeah. Um, I, I'm going to skip Esau's genealogy. Okay, we may return to this. I really want get, to get to Joseph and his brothers. Do you guys have any other comments or questions about that, that passage? It's a, it's a wild passage. Um, terrible. Let's go to 37. Um, 37. Look at there's four issues here. Again, the favoritism is at the fore of the story. Look at chapter 37. Um, the first issue is he's a tattletale. <clears throat> he's 17 years old, right? <laughs> Look at verse 3. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he was the son of his old age. And who was his mama? Rachel. The one he loved, right? The one he loved so dearly. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all the brothers, they hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. You catch that? They can't even speak peaceably with him. He brings, and, you know, he brings a bad report, right? He's a little tattletale. He tells them about what they're doing with the father's flock and the sheepdom. And of course, he, and then he's shown favor, right? So there's two things. Then he has this dream. It's like salt in the wound, right? You know, all the sheaves are bowing down. And then he has this, this agricultural dream where things are bowing down. Then he has this celestial dream where the sun and the moon starts like everyone's bowing down to him. So there's like four strikes against him. And when you think about um, Joseph, the defining theme of Joseph is, uh, it's defining trait is a defining trait is probably loyalty. Is he going to be a loyal? He's a loyal son to his father. He's a loyal servant to Potiphar, um, uh, to Pharaoh. He's a loyal servant to, to Potiphar in the home. He's a loyal servant to Potiphar in the prison. He's loyal to Pharaoh when he goes back into the promised land. Like, that's the number one thing. And so, so when, you, when you come to, um, to verse 12, there's a test here. There's a real test about his loyalty. Look at, look at verse 12. We're going to kind of walk through this. It's like the testing of Abraham. Abraham, would Abraham fear God enough to sacrifice Isaac? Will Joseph fear his father enough to obey and honor him? Look what he's asked to do. It's no small thing. Now his brothers went to pasture their father's flock near Shechem. Think about that. Does that sound like a good idea? <laughs> Think about these brothers. They just took out all of the, the aged men near Shechem basically committed this great atrocity against the city and they're going out to pastor the flock and rub their, their nose in it. And of course, they're supposed to be out in Shechem, so he's going to send like his son. Will you go that way? And think of it. He knows the story. He knows the history. Do you think he's going to be well received by the people of Shechem? Probably not. But will he honor his father? Are not your brothers pastoring the flock at Shechem? Come and I will send you to them. And he said to him, what does he say? Did you guys see that? Here I am. Yeah, that, that hearkens you back to Abra Abraham's response to God when God calls Abraham, when uh, Abraham calls Isaac, here I am. It's, it's the Isaac language. Um, look, look again. It's, it's it echoes of other stories we've heard to this point. When he comes up to them, look in verse, um, verse 21. Verse 18, I'm sorry. They see him from afar before he came near. Right? It's like, you know, uh, verse 21. Tell me if this sounds familiar. When Reuben heard it, he rescued them out of their hands. Let us not take his life. They're plotting to kill him. Like, don't lay a hand on him. Similar to what God says to Abraham to do to Isaac. 
He lifts up his eyes. He sees things coming. They lift up their eyes in verse 25 after casting him down in the pit. They see a caravan. They sat down to eat. And looking up, remember when Abraham looked up and saw the goat caught in the thicket? It's very similar themes here. You have a similar theme of Hagar and Ishmael. Remember, they're, they're sent out um, with what? Wine and bread on her shoulder. And, and the thing about it is shoulder is the same word used as, as Joseph sent out towards Shechem. It's verse uh, 14. So he sent him from the valley of Hebron and he came to Shechem. It's, it's interesting. Um, Hagar wanders in the wilderness and is lost the same way Joseph's lost. He ends up wandering in the field. Do you remember how he's wandering in the field? He's met by this man. They cast down Joseph into a pit. Ishmael's literally cast down beneath a bush. Hagar goes away at a distance so she won't see her son die. The brothers go away to eat lunch so they won't hear his cries anymore. And lo and behold, who comes on the scene? Ishmaelites. <laughs> it's connecting the story of Joseph and Ishmael. Where do they go? Down to Egypt. The same way Hagar and who? Ishmael went. It's, it, there, there's also, um, when, you, when you look ahead, like who took Joseph out of the pit? So the brother seen coming from afar, this, you know, this guy with his coat, this guy with his dreams, this guy who's a snitch, he's coming out you know, probably to snitch on us and check on us again. Let's kill him. They throw him into the pit. Remember, Reuben doesn't want to kill him. Look at the language. We'll just read a little bit together. Verse 20. Come now, let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits. Then we will say that a fierce animal has devoured him, and we will see what will become of his dreams. When Reuben heard it, he rescued him out of their hands, saying, Let us not take his life. And Reuben said to them, Shed no blood. Throw him into this pit here in the wilderness, but do not lay a hand on him, that he might rescue him out of their hand to restore him to his father. So they strip him. They throw him into the pit. Then they sit down to eat. And they look from afar, and they see Ishmaelites coming from Gilead with their, with their camels. And, and when, you, when you think about these interrelated stories that are happening here, right, it, it, it's wild because they throw him into the pit. A lot of people think that the brothers sold him to the Ishmaelites. That's not what happened. More than likely, the Midianites came and beat them to the punch. Look, look what Judah says, verse 26. Then Judah said to his brothers, What profit is it if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites, and let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother and our flesh. And his brothers listened to him. Then Midianite traders passed by, and they drew Joseph up and lifted him out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver. They took Joseph to Egypt. When Reuben returned to the pit and saw that Joseph was not in the pit, he tore his clothes and returned to his brothers and said, The boy is gone, and... And I, where shall I go? Then they took Joseph's robe and slaughtered a goat, dipped it in blood. They sent the robe, they brought it to the fire. Look at the language. Please identify whether this is your son's robe or not. So, there's so many interrelated stories. Let's look at it. The deception of the father. Is this your brother's coat? He's deceived by what? A coat and a goat. <laughs> the same thing that happened when he was deceiving his father. Remember Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Jacob deceived Isaac with what? Esau's coat, Esau's clothes, Esau's hairy clothes, and the goat, the yummy food. Okay? And now here he is. He's being deceived by a coat and a goat. Like the, the bloody, the bloody cloak. Think about what he says. There's, there's a, a bloody garment. Remember, Isaac is being um, the bloody garment. It's reminiscent of Rachel. You remember when they left Laban's place? Laban was after their blood. Okay? And Jacob says, listen, it's time to go. Your father doesn't regard us as favor. They say, hey, what inheritance do we have? You know, Leah and Rachel. Let's get out of here. So they go, but Rachel, of course, remember what she does. She steals the teraphim, Laban's little gods for divinization and what, what practice. And she hides them where? Under a saddle. So Laban's like rooting around. In Gilead this happens. In Gilead. On a camel. And you think of these camels, this caravan's coming from Gilead here to take Joseph out of the pit and sell him down to Egypt. And you remember what, uh, what 
what uh, Isaac says, or Jacob says, whoever's found with the gods shall die. And, and Laban's like looking through all the tents. He doesn't find anything. And of course, she's hiding them on the saddle and like sitting down and says the way of the women is upon her. And you think about if she would have got up from, from that, what would you have seen? Well, you probably, yeah, blo a bloody garment. It's, it's, it's interesting. You know, and look what, he's, look what, look what Jacob says. It, the, the language is so, look what he says here uh, in verse verse. 33, is this your son's robe? A fierce animal has devoured him. Joseph is without a doubt torn to pieces. Like what he says uh, quite literally is he says, uh, taraf, taraf, it's like roke, taraf, he is surely torn. It it's almost literally sounds like teraphim. Teraphim, torn to pieces, like bloody garment, like without a doubt he's torn into pieces. Like remember the search and seizure. Jacob issued a death sentence on whoever they were found, and surely that was Rebecca. Now, he, or surely that was Rachel. And now here's Rachel's son, in a sense, bearing the reproach of the death sentence. And of course, um, Jacob knew that Rachel had taken the gods, because at some point later in the story, he says, "Put all the gods away. Put all those foreign gods away." And here it is, like his his son, his beloved son now is bearing the reproach of the curse that he that he called back that was cast upon the mother. It's coming back to haunt the child. You think of R Rachel, the background of the death sentence, uh, the teraphim. It happened at Gilead as she was seated on the camel, and now the camels come from Gilead, and the torn son reminds him of the teraphim. It's this subtle language. You think of Hagar and Ishmael. Think of Hagar was 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 Sarah's maidservant. She was eventually cast out, and, and Ishmael too. It's a tragic event. It's great injustice, and they go down to Egypt. And the sons of Jacob are associated here, of course, later in the story, with Ishmael and with Hagar. Because what do they have to do to survive? They have to go to Egypt to get grain. Israel is going to, Israel, the nation of Israel is going to start to see themselves in, it's very, in a very real way. They're going to see themselves, um, you know, they're going to have to, as Hagar and, and Ishmael, they're going to be afflicted. They're going to be servants. They're going to be a stranger in a household that is not theirs. They're going to cry out. And then what's going to happen? They're going to be redeemed. And when you think of, of the Old Testament story of, of, of course, the Exodus, really, this is all part of God's plan to get his nation in Egypt. And it's very sobering. You think of all the happenstance that happened. Like he happens to be wandering in Shechem in some field, right? And then he runs into a guy that happens to overhear Other and Dotham 50 miles away. You think all this stuff was just like mere happenstance. No, it was God's providence working. And there's a shadow of, of this Joseph story that there's echoes back to what's happened in the Old Testament already and what will happen in the future. But there's also, like, certainly it casts a shadow over the work of Christ. When you, when you think about Jesus is born the son of Joseph, right? Again, we see a character, Joseph. Joseph is, of course, the son of Jacob. Jesus' earthly father is called by that name. And he has dreams. Remember he has dreams after Christ is born? That who's after him? Herod, right? Herod is, of course, an Edomite. <laughs> Esau, after them. He takes his own son down to Egypt. He brings him back to the land. And you think of Jesus as the Messiah who also, what does he do? He visits his brethren. He visits us. The same way the brothers will come to visit him. Like, you know, he visits his brethren. He, what does he do? We plot against him. <laughs> Let's kill him. Let's crucify him. Here he comes. Obviously, Joseph comes as a snitch, as someone who's boasting in great dreams, of someone who has this fancy coat. And, and Jesus comes laying aside like the prerogatives of, of divinity and glory and takes upon flesh. Comes so weak. And he comes so faithful. And he comes so loving. And he comes so perfect. And yet, what do we do? Cast him onto the cross. <laughs> Cut him off. Crucify him. 
He's betrayed, just you know, like Joseph here in a sense. He's sold into the hand of Gentiles, right? Herod and the Romans, the Jews can't put him. He's sold over into the hand of the Gentiles. And there's great, of course, and the way that goes about, there's great deception and conspiracy with Judas, like the one who would be his kin, betraying him with a kiss. He's rejected. He's um, despised by his brothers. He's cast off. He's sold for what? Mere pieces of silver. He's stripped from his robe. It's not just that he humbles himself to take upon flesh. But when he's crucified, he's crucified naked and ashamed. You get the loincloth because of our PG culture. Naked. First parents are, are what? Naked and unashamed. Your Savior on that cross is stripped of his robe. Crown of thorns on his head, bleeding, bearing your guilt, bearing your sin, bearing your shame because of his love. He descends, in a sense, into the pit of hell on the cross, doesn't he? Darkness over the land. Why have you forsaken me? J J Joseph's left for dead. Christ is you know, forsaken by almost everyone except a few. But what does he do? He rises from the dead. He sits at the right hand of, of power. You think of Joseph in Egypt, in the land of Pharaoh, has all this clout, all this power. And then what does he do? He uses it to deliver his brothers. And his brothers bow down to him. Like this story is, is just, it, there's echoes of your Savior's work and your Savior's love and your Savior's faithfulness to you. This story ultimately points to Jesus. And we think of like what happened to Joseph here. We think how bad it is. And we hear about the cross so much, we're like, yeah, okay. No, he, he did it all because of his love. And he visits his brethren. And he will do nothing, nothing will ever hinder him from coming to you. All that he's endured, he's done it so that he could say to you, as he said to um, basically um, Jacob, fear not, I am with you. I will be with you wherever you go. And that is your God who loves you. Go, go ahead, Barry. Yeah. 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 And even even with we're gonna skip the the, the Judah and Tamar story, and um, what I want to do is is go ahead with Joseph and Potiphar's wife, because what we have in thirty nine is is this great contrast. In thirty eight, you see Judah and Tamar. Judah, of course, what <laughs> was after Joseph's blood. Joseph's gone, and he, he thinks his father will just grieve lightly. Yeah, he'll grieve, he'll miss his son, but of course, um, Jacob's like, my gray hairs are going down to Sheol. Like, he does not get over this grief and this loss, right? And Judah goes like on the spiral. You see him like away from the family, away from, he's with, you know, some, some non-covenantal guy. He has two sons, they're really wicked. They have this wife, Tamar. <laughs> you know the story, right? <laughs> First one dies. The second son doesn't want to, uh, you know, impregnate her for like a Levite marriage to care for her, to keep the name going. God strikes him down because he's evil. And then he's got this third son who's pretty young. It's like 40 years of Judah's downward spiral, right? Sons that grow up, two of them, and then another son that has to grow up. And then, of course, he says, hey, I'll give him to you when he's old enough. And, of course, he withholds that son from Tamar. Tamar seemed like a black widow, right? Everyone she marries dies, but they die for their own wickedness. And so it's understandable Judah doesn't want to give the younger son because he doesn't have like the God's perspective. But nevertheless, he vowed to do it. So she dresses up as a prostitute, goes by, and then, you know, he, he goes into her and you see very similar things. He, he's so carried away with lust, like this other guy, Shechem, like that, that he hands over like a staff and a signet ring. It's not like it's your credit card and your driver's license. These are, these are things of like great authority. It's almost like Esau, very uh, just carried away with his, with his lust and with what he wants. And he hands it over to her and she outwits him. It's a great story about how she outwits him. Do these, please identify these. 
Same language that the brothers use with the coat. You know, Judah, Judah uses to his father, please identify if this is your son's bloody coat. She says, please identify if these things are yours. Oh, okay. You know, and when, she fi- when he finds out that she's pregnant earlier, he's like, hey, cast her into the fire, whatever. And then, no, oh, no, you're the one. Oh, okay. And you know, he pipes down. And then <clears throat> what we have here is Joseph with Potiphar's wife is almost like an instant replay of the garden story. And it comes on the heels of Judah just, you know, head over heels in, in lust, in brokenness, you know, carried away, doing whatever he can to mend his, take his mind off of the betrayal and the death and his father and his family. And you know that. You've been there. What do you turn to? <laughs> and here, here Joseph is. And God's grace is with him. He's betrayed, but he's prospering. And he's got control of everything. And it's like a garden situation. Potiphar basically says, whatever you want, you can do. You know, just not the wife. You can't do that. Like, you have all authority. Like, keep your hands off my wife. It's like the garden replay. What's he going to do? Look, look, look what uh, happens. He's good looking. She sees he's good looking. It's similar to Eve, right? She sees the fruit. She wants to take the fruit. Potiphar's wife sees him, wants to take him. Look, look what he says. Three reasons why he doesn't do it. Lie with me, she says, verse 7. Behold, because my master has no concern about anything in the house, right? His, his trustworthiness of the master, he's put everything under my charge. No one's greater than, his, than me in the house. Nor has he kept anything back from me except you. So he won't do it, trustworthiness to the master. Hey, he's kept me from you. I'm going to honor that. And then the third thing is, is what? Yeah, how can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? And she spoke to Joseph day after day, and he would not listen to her to lie beside her. But one day he goes into the house, no one's in the house, and what does she do? She she has his garment, so he's like, you know, coatless. She's got it. He's faced with a tough decision, right? She's got the garment. She's got the evidence. He's not getting that back. What are you going to do? I've got this. She's got all the leverage. Are you going to be faithful and then run and take it on the chin? Or are we going to get this on? And then, you know, maybe no one ever finds out about it. He's behind the eight ball. And he chooses, of course, to be faithful, doesn't he? And he takes it on the chin for it. And that's where I want to pick up next week. Okay, we're going to close here. Our our time is spent. But um, one thing, my my point of application. Paul mentions in, I think it's 1 Corinthians 6. He talks about food for the stomach. And he's talking about the body and sexual morality. And he says, I will not be brought under the control of anything. That must be true for us, whether it's food or whether it's sex or whether it's any sort of covetousness or idolatry. Like, we must not be brought under the control of anything because we belong to the Lord. We're free from being brought under the control of anything, even if it's fear or, or trusting the wrong things that control us and drive us. Like, we are under God's, in God's hands, under His sovereign control. And we can live worthy of the gospel. And so just keep, keep that in mind. I'm going to close in prayer. Father, thank you for the freedom with which Christ Jesus has set us free. Um, we pray your blessing upon us as we now go to worship you. May um, we bow our hearts before you and draw near to you with our mouths and our hearts. And may you uh, speak to us and strengthen us and change us and make us more like Christ um, as we hear of your goodness and your love. In Jesus' name, amen.